Of course, in the case of Japan, we do not possess nuclear weapons, so we're working now here in Japan to prevent or to get rid of nuclear power plants. In 2011, Shigura Ishiba, a former defense minister, said, I don't think Japan needs to possess nuclear weapons, but it's important to maintain our commercial reactors because it would allow us to produce a nuclear warhead in a short amount of time. It's a tacit nuclear deterrent. Can you comment on this, Mr. Khan? Uh, this way of thinking is something which has existed since a long time ago, particularly within the Liberal Democratic Party. Actually, nuclear power was first promoted within Japan by the former Prime Minister Nakasone, and the reason for this was very similar to the reason in Mr. Ishiba's statement. I personally believe that for Japan, uh, developing nuclear weapons is not an option for Japan and not something that is necessary at all. Why do you think the current Japanese Prime Minister, Shinzo Abe, is so pro-nuclear even after Fukushima? I believe that in the case of Prime Minister Abe, he is not necessarily more pro-nuclear power or stronger for nuclear power than other previous LDP prime ministers. However, the biggest problem, the biggest issue is the fact that he is continuing to push for this even after the experience of Fukushima. So the situation, I don't believe that the current LDP, including Prime Minister Abe, is necessarily more strongly pro-nuclear than they have been in the past. But I just cannot understand why he he can make the decision, how he can make the decision that even having the risk of having to evacuate 50 million people, residents, he still wants to promote nuclear power. Why we have to bear such a risk, I just cannot understand this. It said that there could be an even larger earthquake in the Tokai Trench area of central Japan. Could this lead to a disaster like Fukushima or even larger? I believe that such a risk does exist. It is not possible to prevent natural disasters such as earthquakes and tsunami, but humans can stop, can prevent man-made disasters such as nuclear disasters. If a disaster does happen, as for example, an earthquake in the Tokai Trench, that is exactly why we need to stop nuclear power plants now. Japan is a country and area very prone to natural disasters, similar to the west coast of the United States, for example, and this is why it's so important to uh, get rid of the nuclear power plants now, because even though we cannot prevent the natural disasters, it is possible for us to prevent nuclear disasters. Can Japan secure its energy future without nuclear power? I believe that indeed it is very much possible for Japan to secure its energy needs without relying on nuclear power. My last job when I was in the position of Prime Minister was to introduce the feed-in tariff, and that system, which has now been in place for one and a half years, has led to now there are applications in place for, in the case of solar power, up to 20 million kilowatts of energy to be produced through solar. And actually, in already in operation, is uh, 3.5 million kilowatts in just this one year. And so considering this equivalent capacity, that is a, almost the same as, for example, 20 nuclear power plants. So if we consider what could be done in 10 years, 20 years, I believe that it is very much possible to replace the proportion of electricity and energy needs which are covered by nuclear power with renewable energy. And also up to the year 2050, I believe it is very much possible to decrease the reliance on fossil fuels and cover the majority of power needs by or energy by renewable energy. Japan can follow the path that, for example, Germany is going on now, and Japan has enough technological capacity to do this. You're traveling the world and you've come to the United States. What's your international message, and particularly for President Obama, who is pushing for the building of more nuclear power plants? This hasn't happened in close to 40 years because of the anti nuclear movement and the costs of ensuring nuclear power plants as well as dealing with the nuclear waste. What would you say specifically to President Obama? In regards to the situation in the United States, I have actually been there several times recently and heard from people involved. And I believe that actually the situation, uh, while there is no creation of new nuclear power plants, 
uh, because of the aging nature of many of the plants, there is actually a uh, move towards or reduction of the number of nuclear power plants. At the peak, I heard that there was about 150 plants in Japan, and in the United States, sorry, and the number now I hear is at around 95. But I believe that the big reason for this is the disaster at Fukushima showed the cost of how much it is to maintain the safety of the nuclear power plants, and really showing that economically also, rather than relying on these nuclear power plants, but it's more economically be beneficial to look for other options of energy, including also perhaps fossil fuels and shale gas. So I believe that while there are many plans in place for the construction of new nuclear power plants, they are not actually physically going into the construction phase for this. So my message to Obama would be, when considering energy policy from now and considering the issues and the problems of cost and also nuclear waste, while it may have been once said that there was a nuclear renaissance, nuclear technology now is clearly old and dangerous technology and we need to be looking at other ways. And finally, there is one point which I would like to share also through uh, many different discussions and visiting the United States and so on. But one thing which has left a very deep impression on me through exchange and discussions with the former NRC chair Gregory Yazgo. And the thing that he said to me was, we don't know when or where a nuclear disaster may happen, but we do know that it may happen. And so we need to think not that this won't happen, but think about what to do if this does, or how to prevent this from happening. And he, when he was in Japan, met with many people from Fukushima, many people who were directly affected and suffering from the disaster. And what he said was that Nuclear power plants should not be built in places near where people would have to evacuate if something did happen. And this is the reason, for example, I hear why he was against the extension of the Pilgrim plant near Boston. And I also very much share this opinion with him. Nuclear power plants should not be built in any kind of location where people would have to evacuate if something were to happen. So when we consider that in the case of Japan, there is nowhere where nuclear power plants could be built, should be built. And within the whole world also, I believe, there is no or probably almost no places where a nuclear power plant should be built. So I would like to share this finally. What message do you have for anti-nuclear grassroots activists for reaching the old you, the Prime Minister of Japan, who was pro-nuclear? I personally have visited California, New York and Boston on the invitation of such grassroots anti-nuclear activists and speaking with them and hearing about what they are doing and also visiting Taiwan in a similar capacity. I feel that of course it is important to speak or to approach presidents, congress, parliaments, but more than this we need to look at the local level, how you can speak with your municipal government, mayors, state governor for example, and how to approach and work with local political leaders leaders is the most effective. In the case, for example, of the decision to decommission the San Onofre plant in California, I believe that this was crucial for this point also. So it's very important. My message that I would like to share for grassroots activists is to remember to not only look at the national, but also think about how you can actively approach your local politicians to work for this. Mr. Naoto Kan, arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much. <laughs> Naoto Kan. He was Prime Minister of Japan when the Fukushima Daiichi meltdown occurred. He's one of the few sitting world leaders to have changed his position completely while in office. He's now a leading opponent of nuclear power anywhere. I interviewed him in his offices in Tokyo, Japan. Special thanks to Mary Joyce, Makiko Nakano, and Neil Shibata. When we come back, Noam Chomsky. The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We end our Fukushima anniversary special with the words of the world-renowned political dissident linguist, author, MIT professor Noam Chomsky, who also traveled to Tokyo last week. Noam Chomsky is now 85 years old. He met with survivors from Fukushima, including families who evacuated the area. Their meeting was filmed by the independent online media channel Our Planet TV. This is Professor Chomsky speaking in Japan. Particularly horrifying that this is happening in Japan, which, with its unique, uh, horrendous experiences with uh, the effect of uh, the nuclear explosions, which we don't have to discuss. And of course, it's particularly horrifying when it's happening to children who are defenseless and innocent. But uh, unfortunately, this is what happens all the time. I mean, I had two daughters about, when they were about the age of your daughter, uh, they would come home from school uh, telling us how in school they were taught to hide under desks in case there was a nuclear war.
uh, this was right after the Cuban Missile Crisis, when the world came very close to nuclear war. And children were very upset. I mean, I knew children who were friends of families who were sure they were never going to survive because the world was going to be destroyed by a nuclear war. But the official line was, don't worry, everything's under control. Uh, the same was true again my daughters when they were about her age. Uh, we stopped feeding them milk because uh, the scientists who were concerned recognized that there was a very high level of strontium-90 uh, in the milk that was coming from uh, atomic explosions. The U.S. was carrying out many open-air explosions. And the government assured everyone that there's no problem, but we just, a lot of people like us just stopped feeding the children, uh, gave them only powdered milk, which came from before the uh, explosions. It's, it happens all the time. Uh, so uh, right now, for example, in Iraq, uh, there's a city, Fallujah, which was attacked by U.S. forces using weapons that no one understands, but they leave a high level of radiation. And uh, there's uh, studies by Iraqi and American doctors showing a very high level of cancer among children, far higher than before in the whole neighborhood of Fallujah. But the government denies it, the U.S. government denies it, the Iraqi government is, doesn't function. Uh, the international organizations refuse to look, uh, so it's all being carried out by independent organizations and uh, citizens groups. And this is simply everywhere. I mean, in, uh, in 1961, the United States began the chemical warfare in uh, Vietnam, South Vietnam. Uh, chemical warfare to destroy crops and livestock. Uh, that went on for seven years. Uh, the level of poison, uh, the, they used the most extreme carcinogen known, dioxin. Uh, and this went on for years. Uh, there's uh, enormous effects in South Vietnam. Uh, there are children today being born in uh, Saigon hospitals that deform children in horrible deformations. Government refuses to investigate. Uh, they've investigated effects on American soldiers, but not on the South Vietnamese. And there's almost no study of it except for independent citizens groups. It uh, can add case after case, but it's a horrifying story and particularly horrifying for you because you're suffering from it. Uh, but that's the way governments operate. Uh, they protect themselves from their own citizens. Uh, governments regard their own citizens as their main enemy, and they have to be protect themselves. That's why you have state secret laws. Citizens are not supposed to know what their government is doing to them. Uh, just to give one final example, when uh, Edward Snowden's revelations appeared, the head of U.S. intelligence, James Clapper, testified before Congress that no telephone communications of Americans are being monitored. It was an outlandish lie. Uh, lying to Congress is a felony. You should go to jail for years. Not a word. Uh, governments are supposed to lie to their citizens. Author and MIT professor Noam Chomsky speaking during his visit to Tokyo last week. Special thanks to our Planet TV.